All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I think what we'll do is we will uh, do a little bit of a recap on last week when we were talking about clustering. Then we'll pop out of that. Um, we just want to chat a little bit about the midterm, a little bit about um, expectations around grades in the class, um, and then we'll get back in. But I think we'll do a little bit of recap first because I know I know that you're you're arriving as I talk. So. Um, just a recap as to what we were doing a week ago now. Um, we've been doing unsupervised learning and uh, remember no target labels, just features. And we're trying to summarize or cluster or understand or communicate what is in the data. And I think I finally figured out how to illustrate the cube. I'm not very good with three-dimensional objects. Um, we were we were we were here last week. We were doing non-probabilistic, discrete, unsupervised. And you could argue whether I should be labeling this as discrete or continuous, but I'm kind of emphasizing the discrete classes. So we were down, we were down here. The features, the X's may be continuous. And you will recall that we talked about k-means and here was a little picture. I was also amused to realize that in the UK we see, in the UK we say, we say geezer and in the UK one would say, one would say geyser. Uh, so we were talking about geyser or geyser eruptions of this old faithful uh, uh, water erupting thing in one of the big national parks. And we showed you how k-means runs over that and we said k-means is nice, it's simple, but it's also inflexible. It has these linear decision boundaries. And then we talked about HAC, hack, hierarchical agglomerative clustering. Um, it can generate these beautiful dendrograms, which you've been playing around with in your homework. Remember your homework's due tomorrow. Um, and uh, it's very flexible, but it's arguably somewhat ad hoc. You have to generate a distance function between pairs of examples. You have to find this group linkage function from somewhere. And it suffers the uh, horrible curse of dimensionality when you move into large dimensions where random points in large dimensions tend to, with high probability, have the same distance from each other. And you can see some description of that in my scribbles from a week ago. Um, so, okay, what are we gonna do today? Today, we are going to do the bottom right corner of the cube. Probabilistic, unsupervised and discrete. And we hope that by thinking probabilistically um, and by thinking about modeling our data as a mixture of components, what do I mean? So here, there's, there's like one component in my distribution that here X is one dimensional. Here's another component in my distribution. Here's another component. And the data I see is like a mixture over all three of those. Here's the picture in two dimensions. And we're hoping to convince you by the end of today's lecture that this is a useful exercise. So this is, this is not just we want to use probabilities, but we actually gain something useful through doing this. Okay, so that's 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 what today is all about. Um, just before we continue, Finale and I wanted to uh, just chat a little bit about the midterm and about grade expectations in the course. Um, I I I want to say that we thought the midterm was generally well done. We were encouraged by how you all did. Um, and um, we did though, if you have concerns, wanted to uh, encourage you to reach out and speak with us or the TAs. I know I'm having a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, today, Monday, Tuesday. If you um, are not currently planning to meet with me and you would like to, feel free to email me and we can find time. Um, and then in regard to grade distribution expectations, um, you know, there's not a hard and fast rule, but around, around a half of you, should be getting a grade in the A range. So, so around, around a half of you will be getting either an A or an A minus. Around another, let's say 40% of you will be getting a grade in the B range. 
uh, between B or B plus, and then another 10% of you will probably be getting grades below a B. Um, so, and then amongst the A range, maybe half, half of that 50% will be an A, half of that 50% will be an A minus. So you can kind of think about it like that. We're not giving hard, strict guidance here, but we know some of you may be worrying about your letter grades. We also wanted to emphasize that we um, really do care that the letter grades you get are not arbitrary and we check for robustness in the grade boundaries when we assign letter grades. And we also consult the Harvard College rubric, which kind of tells us how to think about what is a reasonable way to think about what a letter means in the course. Um, do any of you have any questions before we continue with today's lecture? Richard? Yeah, I, I saw in the course calendar that in the round week we have this practical thing. Yeah. Um, what is it and should I be nervous? <laughs> we definitely don't want you to be nervous about the practical. Um, we've added the practical back. We used to have practicals in this course. There were no practicals last year. There, there used to be around three of them. Um, we've added it back because we think it's a fun opportunity for you to do some um, more open ended work with a data set. We are going to set up the practical so that you can get a very good grade with uh, doing something reasonably straightforward and that you can then uh, explore and do more if you want to do more. Uh, we, we, we wanna be clear about how we set the guidelines. We know you're all extremely busy. Um, we don't believe in giving open-ended problem sets that take over your life and that's not our intent. Um, and uh, you will be working in pairs and you could use late days if you choose to. Did that answer your question, Richard? Yes, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? This is a good point to kind of think about where we are in the semester and what's what's happening for the rest of the semester. You've seen around, um, you've seen more than half of the material at this point, by the way. We've obviously done a hard pivot from supervised uh, to unsupervised. We'll be sticking with probabilistic models of unsupervised data for a while, and then we'll be doing reinforcement learning as we get towards the end of the semester. All right. Uh, so then back to the topic for today, um, we're going to be talking about probabilistic methods for understanding data that doesn't have target labels, but more generally, you can be using probabilistic methods for um, understanding data that both has, uh, has features and has labels. And um, I'm going to turn to my co-instructor here. Um, I know Finale has been thinking a lot about um, how to get probabilistic generative models to work for practical problems. Just wanted to invite you to get into the conversation, Finale. For sure. So we've talked about at the beginning, um, you know, the supervised, sorry, unsupervised methods can feel a little bit fuzzy, you know, like what does it mean to have a good clustering and all of these things. And using the Bayesian or probabilistic framework does give us a concrete answer. You know, a good, a, a good model is one that places high probability on the data set. Um, so that, that's great. You know, we have one kind of clear way of, it, of doing this, but we also, many times we want something that doesn't just put high probability on the data set or compress the data set well, but is useful for something downstream. Um, and that's something that my lab has done a lot of work on. In particular, we want models to be very inspectable. Um, so instead of building the ginormous neural models, we actually want to see, you know, can we win this, uh, you know, game with a tiny model instead, <laughs> like a like a five state model or a five cluster model or something like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you can take your model to a medical professional, and he or she will begin to trust your model because they can see the uh, the things that it's doing. Exactly. And, and I think there's an interesting kind of trade off here or interesting conceptual piece where, you know, you might say, hey, if we want to predict mortality outcomes, why bother clustering? Why not just go from the data to the prediction, right? Why not just treat it as a supervised task? And the, the reason why we want this middle ground if we still want clusterings or groupings or something like this is that it might provide some insights about the sort of patient, like someone looks at a particular uh, cluster of patients and they're like, 
oh, I get it. You know, the, the patients who have, you know, advanced liver disease are ones that have really more trouble with their treatments. And we should really think about that more carefully um, rather than something that's much more black box um, where you don't have those insights that you can then build off of. Right. Yeah, that's that's a really great example. Um, so again, we're 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 not going to be we're not going to be talking about target labels today. But I know some of you are 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 can are are continuing to think about um, how general is everything that we're describing. And I had some conversations with you that I enjoyed um, last week about well, you know, you've 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 seen probabilistic models of um, let's say y is given x's in the case of probabilistic regression and now you're starting to see probabilistic models of um, x's and yes like you can have probabilistic models of x's and y's together and you can have priors on those things if you choose to and um, um, you can do lots of things like that and it can be useful so great so uh, thank you finale um, I'm gonna get into now describing mixture models in a little bit more detail. Um, so just as a reminder, our data is one through N and we have no target labels for today, no target labels. And as I said, last, last lecture, We talked about um, k-means clustering, and we talked about hierarchical agglomerative clustering. These are nice. These are simple. I think we can understand what they are, but um, you know, kind of arguably a bit ad hoc. Arguably a bit ad hoc, and uh, hack is flexible. Remember, we said it doesn't need to kind of give you linear decision boundaries. It's a flexible method, but less useful in high dimensions. You know, we wouldn't recommend using hack if you have, you know, ten thousand dimensions. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about this idea of using mixture models. And this is taking a probabilistic generative view. So we'll, we'll, we'll think about our data. as coming from a mixture of components of a distribution. So here's a, here's a picture you might keep in mind. Suppose we're talking about cars. And this is the mass of a car. And we all know that in Europe, people care about the environment and have small cars that are light. And in the US, people don't care about the environment and have big cars that are heavy. And you kind of think about what the overall distribution of a car mass might look like. Um, and so the idea we have today, I'm trying to get better at drawing my light bulbs, is to use the data D to estimate parameters of a mixture model. What does that mean? It's going to kind of be parameters that describe component one, 
parameters that describe component two and parameters that describe how we mix together component one with component two. And a cluster is going to correspond to a component. And we would, for a new X, we would cluster according to the most likely component. New X or a current X, doesn't really matter. Right, maybe I'll just say for an X. This is, this is, this is a high level idea. So far so good? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Richard. All right. Let me draw a graphical model so you can kind of see how we think about this. We're going to have a hidden variable, z, which will represent the components. And then our data, x, Remember how we were using Zs for hard assignments when we were doing k-means? So you can think about Zs the same way. Um, and we'll think about having a prior PZ on the component or cluster from which your data is generated. So this could be, for example, location, EU or the US. And then our data, will come looks a lot like naive Bayes, right? You've got this kind of generative model now for X is given the component. So this is the mass of a car in a location. So if you think about X and Z as being random variables, then we have this is the expression for X and Z. Um, and we would predict P Z given X using Bayes rule as being proportional to that expression. Okay. Now, remember, crucially, these Zs are hidden. So we don't, I, you shouldn't be thinking about the data as giving you the Zs. The data only gives you the Xs. We're describing a model that, that, that we commit to that tells us how we're going to think about how the data is generated. It says we're going to think that the way the data is generated is that somebody samples from the set of possible components, Z, and then conditioned on that, you're in, you're in one of your components and then you pull out an X. That's the commitment that we're making when we talk about this type of probabilistic model. Now, in particular, we're gonna do work with the Gaussian mixture model, EMM. This is a very popular, very typical model for clustering. Um, we have classes, C1 through C capital K, you can think about your Z's as taking on one of those classes. And we have our data living in a D-dimensional real space. Our probabilistic model. So now we'll, we'll make our model concrete. We'll say that the probability that the class is 
equal to CK is by parameter theta K. So this is a categorical distribution or a generalized Bernoulli distribution, probability for each of the possible classes. And then in the generalized mixture model that we're gonna work with, our data conditioned on component CK is normally distributed. Where each of our components now think about as a multivariable Gaussian with mean and covariance. So I'll show you a picture, but you should be thinking about kind of a world where um, uh, maybe in two dimensions, your data might be distributed according to two multivariate Gaussians. That would be a two components multivariate variate Gaussian model in two dimensions. So what are our parameters? Our parameters are, and I'll, I'll, I'll often write them W like we used to, are the priors. Yeah, the thetas are gonna be parameters that we'll estimate. Uh, the priors, theta k's and the means and the covariances. So our parameters need to say, what is the prior we have? What is the probability we associate with each component? And then what are the parameters of the multivariate Gaussian associated with that component? Now, Why is sigma a vector? Sigma is a vector because we're in multi-dimensions. So, so sigma, um, well, it's a matrix. So mu is a vector, and this is the covariance matrix corresponding to one of the components. So suppose there are two components. Component one will be described by a mean vector and a covariance matrix. This is my covariance matrix, and this is my mean vector. Okay, we're used to doing maximum likelihood est estimation. Uh, let's think about what maximum likelihood estimation would look like here. We would, um, for example, be working with the log likelihood. Here, I'm just gonna write my data as capital X for reasons that will become clear later. So what is the log likelihood of the data? It's the sum over N of the log of the likelihood of an individual example, which is the sum over N of the log. Now I have to marginalize out over classes K Remember, I don't know what the relevant class is for example n. Um, and then use the expression we have for the factor distribution. And then now we'll substitute in the parameters. So what is the probability of component K? It's theta K 
and what is the class conditional distribution, it's normal. Yeah, so this is this is this is an expression I've, I've marginalized out over the components that the um, the examples might take. This is an expression for the log likelihood of my data. And the problem with this, we like logs of products, but we don't like logs of sums. See how this is a log of a sum. Um, so the problem with this is that there's no analytical solution. Um, one way to say it is that the log sum structure prevents decomposing over the parameters. Again, if I kind of encourage you to think back to when we were doing naive Bayes modeling, we were able to break up the data and separately estimate the class conditional parameters for label one and separately estimate the class conditional parameters for label two. And that, 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 that way that we were able to decompose things and separate the analysis was, um, was enabled by having a log product type of structure. And here we have a log sum type of structure because I'm having to marginalize out over the, um, uh, the, 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 the latent component that I don't see in my data. And that's leading to a problem that we're gonna solve in a very elegant way. Now, before we go ahead and solve that, we're gonna think about a simpler problem. Let's now pretend that we have the labels, that we, that we have the components in the data. So let's consider a simpler, what we'll call complete data problem. Yeah, good question, Morris. We're not assuming the conditional independence here. So I'm, I'm using naive, not in the way, in the generative sense when I'm drawing those analogs, but not in the sense that we're insisting. Notice, notice that we're not insisting here that our class conditional distribution uh, has the X's independently distributed. If this was a diagonal covariance matrix, then that would be, but in general, will allow for the covariance matrix to be a general covariance matrix. So let's consider a simpler complete data version of the problem. This is, this is a step towards being able to work around the difficulty I just described to you. So suppose that we can observe the class labels Z1 through Zn. Pretend for a second that the, you get given those. And let's write down the what we'll call the complete data log likelihood. And to write this down, we're gonna assume that Zn is one hot encoded. So think about Zn as being a zero one vector where it's one exactly in the component K corresponding to example N. So what is my complete data log likelihood? So now I'm gonna write x comma z, because I have the z's now, what is it? This, let's go ahead and substitute our fitted expression.
And now I've got a log of a product. And now magical things happen. This is looking a lot easier to work with. That pesky marginalization over components has gone away because it's available to you in your data. So I didn't have to write a summation over K. Um, let's now work with this. Let's, let's just think about what these terms are for the uh, mixture, the, the Gaussian mixture model that we're working with. So what is the probability of Zn? Well, I can write that as this expression using the one hot encoding trick that you've seen before. Remember that's gonna pick out exactly the theta for the component for which Znk is one and not pick out the thetas on the other components. And then I'm gonna do the same type of thing for my uh, class conditional distribution. Again, I'm gonna write that as the product now over all walls. Raised to the power Z and K, same trick. So this is gonna pull out the density corresponding to the component for the correct component in which example N lives. Now that I've done these two things, we can go ahead and substitute for them into this expression. Let's do that. And what do I have? I have my log likelihood of my complete data. So logs of products become sums. I've got logs of products. I'm just going to write those as sums. We've seen things like this before. And crucially, now, we can solve this analytically. And if you solve this analytically by taking the first order conditions and setting them to zero, you get this. where uh, nk is the number of examples in ck. Uh, so this says that if, the, if I have this very nicely formulated mixture of Gaussian model with labels on my classes, then I can estimate my probability that an that a example is in component k as the fraction of examples that are in component K, um, I estimate the mean of my class conditional distribution for component K as the mean of the examples that live in that component, the ends such that Zn equals CK. And then I can estimate my covariance by using uh, the standard expression you've seen before for covariance of a multivariate Gaussian on data where the data is the data that lives in component K. I'm gonna write this expression out in more detail later, but for now, just assume this is a very simple analytical expression on that data. 
So this all looks uh, very nice and convenient, but of course, this is a fiction. We don't actually have this complete data. We actually have to work with this thing that is messy and much harder to work with. And um, I'm gonna pause for a couple of minutes, but uh, we will we will work on that in two minutes, okay? So feel free to stretch out, walk around, um, ask questions if I lost you somewhere. Yeah, Richard. Maybe this went okay. um, so I think there are some questions in chat, but um, I'm, I'm wondering what makes the log likelihood we had especially difficult to optimize because we've had similarly messy expressions when we did like neural network yeah. and back yeah. product. That's Is there true. anything make, that makes it like especially pathological? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so it, it's non-convex, but like you said, we've had we've had plenty of non-convex things before. So I have a I have a two-part answer. One is that you have a log of a sum. Um, um, so you end up if if you if you end up using use, using chain rule on that, you end up with uh, reciprocals, right? So you end up with kind of one over things, which is kind of yucky and be, kind of begins to get not so well behaved. So that's part of my answer. Um, the other my answer is that uh, we, we are gonna have a beautiful, robust alternative approach, which we do not have for training and estimating neural network parameters. <laughs> okay, uh, Charu. Um, yeah, so why can we assume that we have all the data? Is it just like to get the solution? Like, is, is it so that we're able to do the MLE or like, yeah, like how are we able to make that assumption? Yeah, no, we cannot make that assumption. This is a step towards something that we're now going to do. This is like, imagine a mythical world that you're not living in where somebody gives you disease. You don't have disease. We don't, we cannot make this assumption. I just showed you if you did have them, things would be good. And can I just point out that this is exactly analogous to our generative supervised classification case so far. Like this, like if we make this assumption, this is exactly the same place where that was easy and lovely, but it's yeah. not here because we don't have to disease. Exactly. All right, good. Well, let's dive back in. Any, any, any other kind of high level conceptual questions that any of you have? So, so far, what I want you to know is um, uh, we have this probabilistic generative model, relatively simple mixture over Gaussians. Uh, it's hard to analytically solve directly. Uh, it's non-convex. We don't want to we could try to use gradients, but it's not a very robust approach. Uh, and we're going to be able to get a better approach. And the approach is going to build on what I've just pointed out, which is that if you had all the data, you'd, uh, you'd in a sense be, as you just heard from Finale, you'd be in a supervised classifier world and we know how to do things if that was what we were doing. Okay, so here comes the main idea for today's class, which is the expectation maximization algorithm. And it will take an iterative approach. We will initialize our parameters somehow. And then repeat. one e step e for expectation use 
the parameters to predict the distribution on assignments Zn for each example. I'm going to explain what all this means, just giving you a high level view right now of what we're going to do. To the M step, update the parameters. This is the maximization step, M for maximization. Update the parameters, maximizing the expected complete data log likelihood given the assignments. Let me say the printed assignments. So this is called the EM algorithm. expectation maximization algorithm. It's going to be an iterative approach. The E step is going to take the current parameters and is going to ask, given those parameters, what is the probability that example N belongs to component K? Think about that if you want as a soft assignment. It's not going to hard assign, it's going to soft assign. And I give a probability that it lives in component one or component two. And here's a car, it's a tiny car, it lives in the EU. There's a huge car, it lives in the US. If it's in between somewhere, you don't know. Maybe you've got some probability. That's the E step. And intuitively, just as I said that if you know the Zs, the likelihood optimization problem is easy. If you have a soft assignment of the Xs to Zs, the likelihood optimization problem is easy. That's the intuition. And we're gonna iterate. We're gonna keep doing this. Soft assign, update the parameters. Soft assign, update. Um, so this turns out to be a very powerful general method to do what? To maximize likelihood for models with latent variables, e.g assignments Z. They are latent, they are hidden, they are unobserved. And the beautiful thing about the EM algorithm is that the M step often has an analytical solution. And in the particular application of EM to GMM, Indeed, the M step will have a nice analytical solution. Let me show you a little picture of what happens when we run uh, GMM with EM on the old faithful geezer or geyser data. Um, here is the initialization. And what Bishop is doing in his textbook here is he's showing you the one standard deviation contours of the two Gaussian components. He randomly initializes them here and here. Uh, what we do in our E step is we soft assign each of our examples to component blue or component red. It's color coded here, you can see this. Then in our M step, we say, okay, if 
your blue component kind of fractionally owns these blue examples, then how does it make those blue examples as likely as possible? Well, this is what it should look like. If your red component fractionally owns all of these examples, how should it make them as likely as possible? This is what it should look like. Here is the result of EM after two iterations. Here is the result of EM after five iterations. And here is the result of EM after 20 iterations. And you can see that uh, the, the uh, multivariate Gaussians are not spherical. You can see that they're trying to fit the shape of the class conditional data. Any conceptual questions at this point? What I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna show you uh, a little bit more precisely what the EM algorithm is. Right now I've just given you a kind of a high level sketch. I know the chat happening as well. So you're probably getting things answered there. Okay, so let me, let me talk about this a bit more. I think things will continue to get clearer. So the E step is going to do a soft class assignment. P Z N equal class K, which we'll write as Q N K. So we're using Qs for the soft assignment, not the hard assignment, is proportional to theta k and then the normal density in that component. That's our E step. Soft assignment using Bayes to uh, understand which components the examples should live with. And now the M step is going to work with the expected complete data log likelihood. What is that? That's this. Maximize over the parameters W the expectation with respect to class assignment Z. And maybe I can even write it like this, to make it even clearer. These Zs are being sampled according to soft assignment distribution Q of what? Of the complete data log likelihood. So we're finding parameters W, the maximize, but the complete data log likelihood, because on Cheru's question, we don't know the Z's, but the expected complete data log likelihood, where the Z's are distributed according to the soft assignment distribution Q. And this will be tractable. This is the M step. And in fact, this will have an analytical solution where theta k will take on this value. What is nk now? It's the sum of the fractionally assigned examples to component k. Mu k will take on one over that nk of the weighted sum of examples. I'm kind of using Qs where I would be using zeros and ones. And 
the covariance estimate oops that's fine is this That's the covariance estimate. So this is, this is all very standard from what you've seen before uh, for um, models of, of, of Gaussian distributions, for classifier models, except now we, you, you've, you, you've got these cues hanging out here where previously you would just hard assign this data is with component one. So I'm just gonna pay attention to that data when I estimate the covariance matrix. Now I look at all the data, but I pay more attention to data with a higher Q. I look at all the data when I fix the, the centroid, if you will, of component K, but I weight it according to the soft assignment weight. So this is the EM algorithm applied to the GMM model. Um, and what I would like to do next is I would like to explain to you how it can be that solution to this expression can be solved as easily as what I wrote down here. That's what I'd like to explain to you. How is it that this is a solution to this problem? Um, but I think before I do that, I think I would just point out some beautiful theoretical properties of the EM algorithm. At each step, the EM algorithm adjusts parameters to improve the likelihood of observed data D. What do I mean? I mean this. The likelihood of the data is increasing from iteration to iteration. And this is this is the observed data. This is just the X's. This is not the X's and the Z's, just the observed data. And I'm writing W T to be the parameters I'm iterating in step T. So what does this tell you? This tells you that converges to a local optimum. Not necessarily global, but it will stop at a local optimum and uh, for that reason, restarts can be useful. Random restarts. So the claim is not that the EM algorithm will, with certainty, give you the global maximum likelihood estimator, but that it will give you a local optimum in some kind of complicated non-convex, uh, on some non-convex function objective. It will find a local optimum. That's the claim. So um, I want to explain why this is the solution to this expected complete data log likelihood. Let me do that right now. So understanding the M step. First of all, where did we start? Let me remind you again about our observed log likelihood. I'm just gonna now work with a single example. Um, I think we can understand everything for one example. You remember this was, and this is the expression that we didn't like. This has a log of a sum. We don't like this expression. This is our observed log likelihood. Then we have complete data log likelihood. Mm 
where we cheat and we pretend that we have we have the z. And this is where we would write this as this factor the log cross the product substitute in the expression. and take the logs of the products. Seen that before earlier today's lecture. And now let's write down the expected complete data log likelihood. This, for a single example, it's the expectation with regard to Zn. Remember, we are going to soft assign example n to some mixture of EU and US. So it's it, we have a probability that Zn is EU, a probability that Zn is the US of the complete data log likelihood, which is just this. This is the expected complete data log likelihood. Let's write down this expression. You know how to take expectations. It's the sum over K. Remember, Zn is a random variable on the components of what? The probability QnK, that component K, that example N lives in component K, multiplied by the log probability in that case. What is the log probability in that case? Well, we factor it as log P CK P XN given CK. So that's my the crucial thing that I want you to make sure you follow. This is my expression now for the expected complete data log likelihood on example M. Uh, and what I've done is I've just written down the probability QNK that example N is assigned to component K. And then I've just written the probability, the joint probability of XN and component K like this. Now, once we have that, look what happens. Got a log of a product where I can just write this as summation over K Q and K log of theta K plus session over K Q and K uh, log of normal X K mu K. Right? Punchline compare compare the structure of these two expressions. They're identical, except one has Qs and one has Zs. And that's why when you solve for the first order conditions to solve analytically the expected complete data log likelihood, you just see the Qs playing the role of the Zs. That's how the mathematics works out. And the intuition is that if somebody tells you the assignments, which happens in each one of these components in my expectation, if somebody tells you the assignments, then you can now kind of break things apart assignment by assignment, uh, component by component by component. 
Um, so I think this is a good point just to pause. Um, I know there's been a lot of stuff flashing by in chat. Let me make sure that people are satisfied and kind of up to speed with what we've been doing. Um, uh, if you are confused about something, please don't hesitate to ask. This is a good moment to ask. Oliver. Um, yeah, I had a question about, um, I guess it's just like the top line, the P, X, N, Y again, is it um, theta K times a normal? Do you mind explaining that? Yeah, sure. It's, it's because what we're doing here, yeah, thank you. What we're doing here is we're taking the summation, we're marginalizing out. that explain it? Yeah, yeah, that's a lot better, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, great. I just wanna um, write down one more thing, which is that overall the M step uh, works with something that looks kind of like this. Just want to write this down so you have it in your notes to stare at. It actually works with all the data, right? Not just example M. But this is the expectation with regard with respect to Z of the log of the, excuse me, of the sum of log and this. Now I can push my um, expectation in through the summation. And it's this expression that I was just working with. I just, just want you to have that. I don't want to pause on that, but I want you to have that to stare at if you ever get confused about that in the future. I just did all of this just for one example. So, okay, great. Um, I want to make a few comments. One is that initialization matters. I'm going to give you a concept check on this in a second, and you'll you'll be you'll be you'll be thinking about, e.g., what happens if. All of the thetas are initialized to be uniform and all of the Gaussian parameters are the same in each K. So we'll think about what happens with EM applied to GMM in that case. Uh, you might also think about what happens if theta one is greater than everything else. And again, all of the other parameters are the same for each. Okay. Those are two things that we'll get back to once we've done our concept check. Um, the other thing I want to tell you is that you uh, you can you can choose a variation on what we've talked about. E.g., we've been talking so far about the general approach, where you have these uh, general multivariate Gaussians for each component. How many parameters are there here? Well, I've got uh, K minus one for my thetas. I've got K times D for my means. 
and I've got k times d squared for my covariances. Or you can say, no, I'm going to insist that my multivariate Gaussians are diagonal. So this is the independent case from naive Bayes, k minus one, kd, kd. So you've got fewer parameters now. Or you can say, no, you know what? I want them to be spherical. Also sometimes called isotropic. What is that? I'm gonna insist that my covariance matrix is just an identity matrix multiplied by a variance uh, equal to sigma squared. And this is k minus one, kd uh, plus one. Uh, sorry, plus, yeah, one. Actually, k, one per component. It's okay. And one thing I want to point out here is that in this case, you get linear decision boundaries. In the other cases, you don't get linear decision boundaries. And then I think the last point I want to make is that three, this connects back to k-means. So remember that k-means repeats one harder sign each example to nearest prototype to update prototype to centroid of assigned points. which is the mean of these sign points. That's k-mean, so you've been using in your problem set. Um, so let's think about a very special case of EM where we're just gonna fix the class probabilities. We're not gonna allow them to move at one over k. And we're gonna consider the spherical uh, Gaussian. Uh, for some variance epsilon that is small and positive. And in this case, the E step would hard assign or be, you know, almost, almost hard assign because you want to think about these Gaussians now that, that are very spiky and all the data's in the tails. And because of the exponential tails, you get a hard assignment to the closest, the closest prototype, the closest components. And the M step, we're actually just going to fix these. So this is constant, this is constant. The only parameters are the means. And so now the end step, the M, the M step will just update the means to the, uh, the centers of the Gaussians, the means of the Gaussians to the new centroids of assigned data. So it's exactly the k-means algorithm. So k-means, so the punchline of that is that k-means is a special case of EM for GMM where you pin down the thetas to be one over k, don't allow the covariances to move and you make them be spherical with very small variance and you run EM. And it, in the limit as epsilon gets smaller and smaller, it's exactly mimicking k-means. Okay, great. So what I wanna do now is, and, Let me walk you through the concept check, and then we'll send you into um, 
the rooms. Let me just chat this out to you all. So here's the concept check. Uh, suppose you initialize EM for Gaussian mixture model, like I said, then one, the step is not well-defined. Two, none of the parameters will change. Three, the parameters will slowly move and the EM algorithm will eventually improve the mixture model. Suppose you initialize EM in the other way I described, where theta one is larger than the other thetas. One, two, and three are unchanged. Four, all data will eventually be assigned to, in the E step, to component one. And then the last question is, suppose the data can serve both an image and a tag, say cat or dog, and the dimension of the image is a lot larger than the tag. Will the output of the model differ much from a model that is trained with just the images? So it's data where X is image and tag, say cat or dog. Um, and we want to know whether you think the uh, results of running EM with GMM on this will differ very much with or without the tag. So I'm just going to go ahead now and set up the breakout rooms. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Okay, so just to wrap up here, um, first question, the correct answer is none of the parameters will change. And the second question, the correct answer is none of the parameters will change. Uh, so it looked like most of you fell for my trick in the second question. I don't believe that's right. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, the last question, uh, I suppose the data consists of both an image and a tag, say cat or dog. And you mentioned the image is a lot larger than the tag. Will the output of the model differ much from a model that's trained just for the images? Uh, no, because it's trying to maximize the likelihood and that one feature is not getting any more attention than all of the other features that represent the image. So no is the right answer there. Let me explain at least the answer to this one uh, in a way that will be satisfactory and then hopefully the second one too, before you all have to run. And I know we're slightly over time as well. <clears throat> so um, here's what we wanna be talking about. Let's think about the case where theta one equal theta two equal a half and mu one equal mu two and covariance one equal covariance two. Suppose this is true. Um, first of all, what will the E step do? Well, um, um, hopefully you, realized that the uh, the e step will 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 soft assign uh, every example with probability equal to a half to each of the components because the the Gaussian part of the components are identical and the prior part of the components are identical. So it will soft assign one half, one half for every example. And now think about what the M step will now will 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 now do. Well, uh, each component has the same data, with the same weights, and so each component will uh, um, uh, will acquire exactly the same um, the same mu's and covariances, and then the same thing again exactly will happen. And now, as I was walking you through this. I realized that the question <laughs> was not super well posed, but hopefully you learned something anyway. So what I've just realized is that the assignments of the data don't change, but just in that very initial step, the mu's and the sigmas do change. So now, now I realize it wasn't a well-crafted uh, concept check. 
but we can learn from even not well-crafted concept checks, right? So the point is that the mu's and the sigmas move and then they stay there, but all the way through, the points will be soft assigned 0 0.5, 0 0.5. That's what, that's what would happen here. Now, the next question said, suppose that the, uh, the Gaussian components are the same for one and two, but now theta one is larger than theta two. Um, so now the uh, QNK is, let's say it's uh, two thirds, one third in the thetas. The QNKs will be two third, one third between component one, component two, um, which means the theta will be two third, one third. But notice that the, um, the, the, the means and the covariances will be the same for both of those two classes because they, um, they're carrying each of the points in a relative way, in exactly the same way. It's just that there's some scalar that's pulled outside all of the Qs, which is like a two to one multiplier between component one and component two. And so the conditional update, the M step, will be the same for the mu's and the sigmas for each of the two components. And then um, I also claim that the thetas will remain at two thirds, one third. And so I believe the correct answer to the second comprehension question is, uh, again, it was slightly misposed, but is the data will remain uh, kind of as it was initially soft assigned and the components, the parameters will change once, but then will remain unchanged. And that, that is a wrap for today. Um,